told me it was Ernest. I have introduced you to everyone as Ernest. You answer to the name of Ernest. You look as if your name was Ernest. You are the most earnest looking person I have ever seen in my life. It is perfectly absurd you're saying that your name isn't Ernest. It's on your cards. Here's one of them. Mr. Ernest Worthing, B4, the Albany. I'll keep this as a proof your name is Ernest in case you ever try to deny it to me or Gwendolyn or to anyone else. Well, my name is Ernest in town and Jack in the country, and the cigarette case was given to me in the country. Yes, but that does not account for the fact that your small Aunt Cecily, who lives in Tunbridge Wells, calls you her dear uncle. Come, old boy. You had much better have the thing out at once. My dear Algy, you talk exactly as if you were a dentist. It is very vulgar to talk like a dentist when one isn't a dentist. It produces a false impression. <laughs> well, that's what dentists always do. Now, go on, tell me the whole thing. I may mention that I have always suspected you of being confirmed and secret Bunburyist, and I'm quite sure of it now. Bunburyist? What on earth do you mean by a Bunburyist? I'll reveal to you the meaning of that incomparable expression as soon as you are kind enough to explain why you are Ernest in the town and Jack in the country. Well, produce my cigarette case first. Here it is. Now, produce your explanation and pray make it improbable. My dear fellow, there is nothing improbable about my explanation at all. In fact, it's perfectly ordinary. Old Mr. Thomas Cardew, who adopted me when I was a little boy, made me in his will his guardian to his granddaughter, Miss Cecily Cardew. Cecily, who addresses me as her uncle from mo motives of respect that you could not possibly appreciate, lives at my place in the country under the charge of her admiral governess, Miss Prism. Where is that place in the country, by the way? That is nothing to you, dear boy. You are not going to be invited. I may tell you candidly that the place is not in Shropshire. I suspected that, my dear fellow. I have been buried all over Shropshire on two separate occasions. Now, go on. Why are you Ernest in town and Jack in the country? My dear Algy, I don't know whether you will be able to understand my real motives. You are hardly serious enough. When one is placed under the position of guardian, one has to adopt a very high moral tone on all subjects. It's one's duty to do so. And as a high moral tone can hardly be said to conduce very much to either one's health or one's happiness, in order to get up to town, I have always pretended to have a younger brother in the name of Ernest, who lives in the Albany and gets into the most dreadful of scrapes. That, my dear Algy, is the whole truth, pure and simple. The truth is rarely pure and never simple. Modern life would be very tedious if it were either, and modern literature would be a complete impossibility. That wouldn't be at all a bad thing. Literary criticism is not your forte, my dear fellow. Don't try it. You should leave that to people who have not been to university. They do it so well in the daily papers. What you really are is a Bunburyist. I was quite right in saying you're a Bunburyist. You are one of the most advanced Bunburyists I know. What on earth do you mean? You've invented a very useful younger brother called Ernest in order that you may be able to go to town as often as you like. I have invented an invaluable permanent invalid called Bunbury in order that I may be able to go down into the country whenever I choose. Bunbury is perfectly invaluable. If it wasn't for Bunbury's extraordinary bad health, for instance, I wouldn't be able to dine with you at Willis's tonight, for I have been really engaged to Aunt Augusta for more than a week. I haven't asked you to dine with me anywhere tonight. I know. You are absolutely careless about sending out invitations. It's very foolish of you. Nothing annoys people so much as having to not receive invitations. You had much better dine with your Aunt Augusta. I haven't the smallest intention of doing anything of the kind. To begin with, I dined there on Monday, and once a week is quite enough to dine with one's own relatives. In the second place, whenever I do dine there, I'm always treated as a member of the family, and sent down with either no woman at all, or two. In the third place, I know perfectly well whom she will place me next to tonight. She'll place me next to Mary Farquhar, who always flirts with her own husband across the dinner table. It's not very pleasant. Indeed, it's not even decent. And that sort of thing is enormously on the increase. The amount of women in London who flirt with their own husbands is perfectly scandalous. It looks so bad. It is simply washing one's clean linen in public. Besides, now that I know you to be a confirmed Bunburyist, I naturally want to talk to you about Bunburying. I want to tell you all the rules. I'm not a Bunburyist at all. 
If Gwendolyn accepts me, I am going to kill my brother, and indeed I think I'll kill him in any case. Cecily is a little too much interested in him. It is rather a bore, so I am going to get rid of Ernest, and I strongly advise you to do so with me. Your invalid friend who has the absurd name. <laughs> Nothing will ever induce me to part from Bunbury. And if you ever get married, which seems to me to be extremely problematic, you will be very glad to know Bunbury. A man who marries without knowing Bunbury has a very tedious time of it. That is nonsense. If I marry a charming girl like Gwendolyn, and she is the only girl I ever saw in my life that I would marry, I certainly won't want to know Bunbury. Then your wife will. You don't seem to realize that in married life, three is company and two is none. That, my dear young friend, is the theory that the corrupt French drama has been propounding for the last 50 years. Yes, and that the happy English home has proved in half the time. <laughs>